Okay, how did everybody like episode four? I loved it. I thought it was great. And there were so many callbacks to <clears throat> Beth and Daryl's story. So before I get started, I'm sorry I didn't get any of the Bethel asks out last week. I will do be doing some this week. I've just been so ridiculously busy for the last two weeks, but finally, hopefully getting back into a normal routine. Um, so I will have more of those out as the week progresses. Um, but let's go ahead and dive into the episode. Um, there was some talk, and I honestly did not see much of it because, like I said, I was busy. I really haven't been online that much. But there was some talk about it being kind of a still episode because there were only two characters in it. Now, that's only happened a handful of times. Um, there was obviously still. There was Consumed with Daryl and Carol. And then there was Find Me with Daryl and Leah. But those are like the only ones, really. Um, where they've done that. So it was interesting, and we kind of figured we would get a lot of callbacks to Still. So the first thing we noticed was the music on the radio that starts playing at the very beginning. I immediately noticed that it had lyrics that kind of reflected Beth imagery. Um, I'm coming home. I've done my time. The the song is about leaving a yellow ribbon tied on the oak tree. Uh, Three long years have passed. Do you still want me? And there's a part that talks about staying on a bus. Now, this is actually a fairly well-known story, and I've heard different versions of it. The first one I ever heard, uh, it's about a guy who's coming home from prison, and he's not sure if his family still wants him around because he's brought a lot of shame onto their name. And so he writes them a letter and says, "If if it's okay for me to come home, tie a ribbon on this tree, and that way I'll know that you're okay with me coming home. And if not, I'll just keep going a few towns over and set down roots somewhere else because I don't want it to be too painful for everyone. But in the version I heard, he was actually on a train, and it was a white ribbon around the tree. But as you can see, it's, it's all kind of the same story. They're just different versions. But obviously, um, they would have chosen this one, Gimple would have chosen this one for the imagery. The yellow ribbon, the bus, that's a very common symbol we've seen. Um, but it's interesting that this guy is getting out of prison. Now, of course, that goes really, really well with what happens in this episode with Rick and Michonne, so I have no doubt that it does um, apply to them for the most part. But, you know, we see a lot of that imagery imagery around Beth as well, being trapped, being in a prison, um, not being around her family for a long time, that sort of thing. So, of course, it totally (laughs) caught everybody's ear. And then W.D. Way looked up um, the person who sang the song who created the song and the group who sings it is called dawn d-a-w-n which is obviously the name of the woman at um grady but it also is a theme you know the new dawn the new sun the new day all of that so we're just right off the bat seeing a lot of imagery through the lyrics of that song that point to beth Now, they get into this new place, and you have to understand, this is something that Gimple also said, or no, no, it was Denai said it after the episode and the episode Insider, and that was that this is just a place for them to go in order to figure out their emotional stuff, basically. She called it um, like a cocoon that was created for them, and so that they could, you know, Rick and Michonne could reconnect and figure out their truth, and so she could get the truth out of him for why he was reluctant to leave, And then once it served its purpose, it literally crumbled to dust. And that is very, very much what happened in Still. In their case, they burnt it down. It didn't just crumble. But even so, it was a place for them to go to figure their stuff out. And then once they did, that cocoon, you know, to use Denai's uh, word, it it stopped existing, right? It just wasn't there anymore. So that I thought was really, really interesting that they created this place to be that. Now, of course, I didn't hear her say that until the end of the episode, but right off the bat, it really felt like still to me. They went into this place, um, and and I suppose it was a combination of still and alone, because one thing I noticed is that it was very clean, and they even made the point about the Roomba being there, and I I actually thought that was hilarious, that it totally freaked Rick out, but um, I actually laughed a lot during this episode, because when, when the two of them are arguing and fighting and, like, snipping at each other, it was just, like, an old married couple, and I just, I laughed a lot. I thought it was really funny, um, but it was also a very tender and a very sweet episode and a very romantic episode. Anyway, when they first get into this place, they immediately start yelling at each other, and it just felt like Beth and Daryl yelling at each other at the Moonshine Shack. Like, that's really the vibe that you get off of it, because, um, I mean, it's even the roles are exactly the same, right? It's Rick 
he's hiding behind his feelings. He doesn't want to tell her the truth about what's going on with him. And she's trying to get him to tell her and trying to get him to deal with his own emotions and his own feelings and uh, his own trauma, everything he's been through. And that's exactly what was going on with um, Beth and Daryl and still. So there were a lot of parallels there. Um, we see them when they get there, they start looking around and they start looking in the cabinets and in the refrigerator. Exa- again, exactly what they did in alone when they got to the um, funeral home. Uh, Michelle changes into different clothing, which Beth did at the golf club. And what Michonne puts on is, is actually pretty interesting. She's wearing a yellow tank top. So we got the yellow there. And that's, it just screams Beth because they're both wearing yellow tops. This is where Beth put on her yellow polo was when she changed in the golf club. Michonne is also wearing a light blue button-up shirt over that, um, which doesn't last terribly long. It kind of immediately gets dirty and starts to fall off. But I kind of felt like that was a nod to Beth's scrubs at Grady because this isn't a dark blue shirt. It's a very, very light, like baby blue. And most of the time Beth was at Grady, she was wearing that color of scrubs. So um, that was kind of interesting, very intentionally chosen colors of clothing. Um, Rick does see the X scar on Michonne's back and she accidentally says children. So he finally knows about RJ, but I was really glad that uh, she, they found that out. And I had to laugh at the voice in the wall and that Rick was freaking out about it. That was another thing that made me laugh when he was yelling about the voice in the wall. But here's the thing. I do think the voice in the wall was very symbolic of something. And I had to think it through a little bit. When we first hear it, you know, it says, welcome home. And then it talks about how their preferred temperature setting will be reached in 10 minutes. It says that a couple of times. And then when they come back to the room after a bunch of stuff has happened, it says temperature malfunction and that it's breaking down and things like that. So I was trying to figure out, um, at first I thought maybe it meant the two of them, you know, the preferred temperature Uh, pointed to the two of them kind of understanding each other and being on the same page, but I don't think that's what it was. I actually think the preferred temperature um, referred to Rick's mind brainwashing, I guess, like the, the degree to which the CRM was kind of controlling his mind or his mindset. So, um, they get in and it says your preferred temperature will, be reached in 10 minutes and then 10 minutes later it says we have reached your preferred temperature and during that part rick was dead set on not going with michonne and um returning to the crm so you could say that that was his preferred temperature to stay there where he had sort of created the space in his mind where he was safe you know safe from the hurt of losing people again he talks about carl later in the episode and all of that um but then when it comes back you know she's starting to be able to crack through that facade those walls he's put up and so that's why the temperature is malfunctioning. And then, of course, whatever that is, the voice in the wall, the, the temperature gauges, all of that um, gets crushed when and completely destroyed when the building falls down. You know, so I think that's what it is. It's, it represents um, the way in which the CRM has Rick trapped, but in his own mind. Um, they do see that their helicopter crashed, which means everyone will believe them dead. And that's it's also really interesting that... Um, he says, you saved our lives by throwing us out of the helicopter. And I'm not sure exactly how to articulate the theme of that, um, especially where especially where Beth and Daryl are concerned, if it's you know meant to be a parallel there. We didn't see anything crash with them, but, I mean, the prison went down, and you almost wonder if, if the prison hadn't gone down when it did and they hadn't all scattered, if the CRM was already watching them or if there's something bigger that would have eventually um, come for them or something. I don't know. I feel like they're trying to tell us something with that, but I'm just not sure exactly what it is yet, but it was really, really interesting. Um, So I I wrote down, uh, Rick's making excuses. He's hiding just like Daryl and still. And then we have, after this first argument, Michonne storms away, right? She says, I'm leaving. Fine. You have your wish. You stay. I'll go. And she leaves, which is a whole lot. It, what it reminded me of is um, Beth leaving at the beginning of Still, in that case, to, you know, find a drink and I can take care of myself and all of that. But we just have this kind of similar moment where she leaves and he doesn't follow her right away. And she didn't think he's going to follow her, but then he pops up behind her and um, then they're kind of together again. Um so again, just random things throughout the episode constantly reminded me of Beth and Daryl's storyline. 
Um, when she first leaves the apartment, when she storms out, she's standing in the hallway, and that definitely has Grady vibes. I mean, this is the hallway of, like, an apartment building, not a hospital, but it looks very similar to the hospital, especially the way the windows are constructed and, and, you know, big open windows that look out over the city. It looks like the hospital, and there are exit signs on both sides of the hallway um, above her on the ceiling, so definite Grady vibes there. Um... Rick does follow her, and then a second helicopter appears and kind of torpedoes the first. Um, Then she leaves her knife behind, so Rick kind of tackles her to protect her and ends up on top of her, because, you know, naturally. And then we see them run away, but we see her knife left on the floor. And it almost, I don't know, it almost felt like, is that supposed to be a Beth moment? Like... Beth left her knife behind, you know what I mean? It also felt a little bit like a Cinderella moment. I mean, it's sort of <laughs> uh, The Walking Dead's answer to Cinderella. She didn't leave her shoes, she left her knife, you know? But it, it did. It just kind of felt like they went running, and there's the knife still sitting there. So, again, it's they're trying to tell us things, and they're trying to point to things. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a little unclear, but, again, just get really, really heavy Beth vibes from it. Um, then they are running from the walkers, and they move into a dark hallway that looks almost exactly like the golf club. So when Beth and Daryl were running around in the, in the golf club, and especially when they were running between rooms and he had a flashlight, it looks exactly like that. Very, very similar. The, the main difference is that red, uh, Rick's light is red, so it creates a lot of red light, and we didn't have that at the um, golf club. Uh, he also asked Michonne, are you okay? And Daryl asked Beth that after she hurt her ankle. Um, <laughs> Another thing that I cracked up about is them, again, this was just them sniping at each other, but defensive position commando, and they're both, <laughs> they're both so irritated with each other, it just makes me laugh. Anyway, um, they found a lab with walkers in it, so I actually kind of thought that would be a bigger part of the story. You know, me and my fellow theorists were talking last week after seeing the preview um, about them ending up in a lab where there was obviously some experimentation going on, but it wasn't a huge part of the story. So... I mean, I still think it's a nod to the CRM and possibly to experiments going on at Grady. The point is, I mean, if this was the place where we had to break down Rick's walls and the hold the CRM had over him, then in another way, the the apartment would represent the CRM in general, and then it it cracked, it broke down. Um, but it could also it could also represent Grady because that's where Beth was trapped. And we know that they were probably doing experimentation at Grady. So it's it's just interesting the little tiny, subtle uh, references that they throw in the whole time. Um, they find a note, and the note... I, I'm, I'm reading more into the symbolism than the note itself. It was just left by one of those researchers who finally committed suicide, which I suppose is a throwback to Dr. Jennings at the in the first season. But the thing is... Um, the note starts with, it's time. And that, that really jumped out at me, like, what are they trying to tell us about time? Are they trying to tell us that something's wrong with time? Or that the time has come, that Beth is finally going to be revealed? I mean, it was just like, it's kind of a strange way to start a letter, even a, even a suicide note. It's time. And you know that Gimple <laughs> wrote that in there. And then they said that their operation was called Greenwood, so we have a green reference in there. And... The walker that wrote it, I mean, it looked like they might have electrocuted themselves. They had kind of wires hooked up to a, a thing in the wall. But I noticed that they had a lot of blood that had come out of their eyes. Now, that very well could have been just a result of how they killed themselves. But um, it's also a throwback to the prison and the bleeding eye disease from the veterinary college. All of the walkers had that there. And we never really learned in detail what that was. But again, most of us have just come to believe that everything from season four on, and it reaches back into earlier seasons too, but especially from when Gimple took over as showrunner, there's been a bigger storyline going on in the background than what they're actually showing us. And, you know, maybe the fact that um, the people at the prison went to that college and took the meds, maybe somebody knew they were there, maybe somebody thought they were infected, um, maybe they were focusing on the prison and then the prison went down, which was a hundred percent because of the governor. But maybe if it hadn't, they would have gotten a visit from somebody else. You know, maybe that's why, um, some of them were being tracked, you know, especially Beth and Daryl, we don't know. And and it's all conjecture, but we really do think there's a bigger story going on here. So it was interesting that this Walker looked to have been bleeding from the eyes. Um, 
I also noticed holes in the ceiling, big gaping holes in the ceiling during this part, which is part of the hole in the roof symbolism, which I've talked about before. I also wonder if the commando reference is uh, kind of foreshadowing something. So, I mean, obviously the thing that comes to mind is the old Schwarzenegger movie from the 80s, but that is about um, somebody's daughter being kidnapped and having to go and save her. And the idea is that um, if they refuse to help the bad guy wage his war, then the daughter is going to die. So, I mean, that could be very much what's going on with Rick. You know, if, if he doesn't help Jadis and stay there, then she's going to kill Alexandria, you know, but it also could be a foreshadow of things to come. So we'll just have to wait and see how that one play, plays out. Um, it's also, I thought it was really interesting and really well thought out that at first, the two of them, Rick and Michonne, were not fighting well together. I mean, like physically fighting walkers. They kept tripping over each other and, and snapping at each other and um, getting in each other's way and almost getting bitten and things like that. Then we have this part where the chandelier falls and ends up trapping Michonne's leg. So they didn't focus too much on her being hurt, and she does tell Rick that she's not hurt. She's just kind of trapped under it. But it still felt a little bit like a parallel to Beth hurting her leg in the small game trap in Alone. And, you know, at the very least, he had to help get her out, and Daryl had to help get Beth out. Um, so after that, I noticed that immediately they started fighting better together. Still not perfectly, but a lot better than they had been. So it's like you can kind of see how things are evolving that way, and I thought that was a really interesting way to show us how things were evolving. Um, because the helicopter is torpedoed, the building is buckling, it's coming down. Um... The part where she's trapped actually reminded me a lot of... So you have walkers coming in at her over the rubble, and it reminded me a lot of the tunnel in 4B where um, Glenn and Maggie were reunited. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but I mean, in each of these cases, these things that they're calling back to, we are talking about two lovers who are soulmate couple who is a soulmate couple who have been separated and are reunited so i think it's i think it is purposeful that it's very very similar to those things um she uses a lighter in this part which is a lot like rick in the pilot episode he was in kind of the same place like a stairwell that um uh, what's the word it's like a spiral because it's going up or down you know and he used his lighter there so that may have been an interesting reference um the other thing is that they kept mentioning elevators, which was interesting. <laughs> now, elevators, we've talked about how because they move up and down um, vertically, they might be symbolic of moving between worlds, like between the living world and the underworld or something. Um, but it's interesting to me, first of all, it was like the voice in the wall kept mentioning the elevator and that the elevator only had... 10 minutes of reserve power left. And it was just, I mean, it's kind of random, right? Why would the voice in the wall need to tell them that? And it's obviously something that was purposely put in. Now, then they ended up at the very end using the elevator to get out. And for me, I, I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of elevators anyway, but even so, I don't think I would want to use the elevator because if the power's dying and the building's coming down, wouldn't you rather use the stairs and just make sure you can get out? And yeah, you know, I'm sure you could make all kinds of arguments. Maybe the, there were too many walkers in the stairway or, or whatever. But the point is, it's a very purposeful choice to have them take the elevator down. And obviously, there was an elevator shaft at Grady with Beth that was a big part of the storyline. So there's that as well. Um, in this case, the I mean, it, well, really in both cases, the elevator is how they escaped, right? So... Noah and Beth left through the elevator shaft when they tried to escape, and then she, of course, got captured again. And here, when they're leaving the building, which is crumbling around them, this is how they got out and were able to run out of the building and get away. So um, I suppose you could always call the elevator an escape. It's just kind of interesting the way that it was used here. A couple of other random thoughts I had while watching up to this point. The first one is that the helicopters always crash. <laughs> Have you noticed that? So we haven't had we haven't actually seen that many helicopters, right? But we saw one um, back in season three when the governor was first coming into the storyline that crashed with all the military guys. Uh, the one that Rick was on with Okafor crashed. Of course, that was Michonne's fault. And then this one crashed. And you know, Rick was taken away on a helicopter to the CRM. Obviously, that one didn't crash. So it's not all of them, but I think there's kind of a, a motif here going on about how the helicopters always crash. And, you know, it, it, it's just occurring to me now, it, it very well could be a symbol for um, the fact that 
it's all fake, right? That's what Michonne says to Rick, that his, you know, presumed loyalty to the CRM or wanting to save them, it's just not real. And so maybe that's the point, is when he's on a helicopter, um, it's it's just a symbol that that's breaking down and that it would have killed him, you know, emotionally and spiritually, if not physically, if he had stayed on that course. So Michonne yanked him out into something that was really hard, into the stormy sea, where he was going to have to you know, go through a lot to, you know, get his emotions out and figure out what was actually going on. But the alternative was death, right? So anyway, just really interesting symbolism. Um, I need to look through the books a little bit better. Uh, Michonne pulled out Ramona the Pest by Beverly Cleary, and I didn't get a, a super good look at all of the books, but I noticed that a lot of them were computer programming books. So there might still be some other gems in there, and I'll have to look more closely at that and then talk about it later. Um, what else do we have? So they end up going back to the same apartment, and of course they make love, and then Rick, you know, finally does talk to her about everything, and I, I loved everything about that part. It was very sweet, and it was very tender, and the part that showed him and Carl as a little kid, I was like, oh, that breaks my heart. Um, they do finally talk about RJ. Then we have the bit uh, with the Roomba, and again, I think the Roomba is meant to um, connect this to alone. If you remember when they first got to the uh, funeral home, they, they made the remark that it was very clean. And I think that's this is like their answer to that. They wanted it to be clean in a similar way without you know having Rick and Michonne say the exact same thing. So they had a Roomba there that would make it be really clean so that they could point that out. Um, more than once, Michonne tells him it's bullshit, which is also uh, Beth Line. They said, she said he's still trying and specifically trying to go home. And again, trying, it wasn't even so much around Beth. We got a little bit around her, but I specifically remember it being in Consumed. Uh, Daryl yelled it at Carol about how she was here. She was trying. She needed to keep trying. So that was just a, a theme that we had around season five and all of the arcs in season five a lot. Now, uh, one thing that I do want to talk about, and I mentioned this last week because I saw it in the trailer, is Rick says, we have to go back. Now, back in season five, there was a really, really big theme of you can't go back, right? We heard it at Terminus. Gareth said it to Bob. You can't go back, Bob. And I think we heard it a couple of times in the interim as well, but I don't remember exactly when. And then we definitely heard Rick say it at Grady. So... Um, you know, evil officer Bob, as I like to call him, Lamson, who Rick ends up killing. He said it to him, too. You can't go back. And I always felt like we didn't entirely understand what that theme was about. I mean, yeah, we understand the words they're saying, but why do they keep saying that? And what is what are the writers trying to tell us in a bigger context? Um, and then we have Rick saying this here. We've got to go back. And then Michonne at one point does say, I don't think you can go back. So we're having a repeat of that theme, and that makes me really happy because not only do we understand it a little bit better now in this context, but it just goes to show that those themes that were going on in season five, they were already looking forward to where we are right now, which, you know, we, we knew that. We know that Gimple's been planning this for a long time, but other people don't, right? And this is like just evidence of it. When he was um, playing out the story of season five, he was thinking about the CRM and he was foreshadowing it, which is just another evidence as well that Grady was probably tied to the CRM. So what does it mean? I think what it comes down to is that it's kind of the like, like the um, you can't go home again theme that you hear people say. And it's not that you physically can't go home again. It's just that once you've left, you've changed and you've grown. So when you go home, it doesn't feel the same and it's never going to be the same. And I think it's kind of the same thing here. It's like about gaining some sort of knowledge and then you can't go back to how things were. So what Michonne is trying to say here is that even if she did what Rick wanted, even if she left and went home and left him there, which, you know, obviously she was never going to do. But if she did, she said, I don't even think you can go back. So he could physically go back to the CRM, but it's not going to be the same because he's seen her now and he knows about his other child now. And he's not going to be able to just keep his head down and do what they want anymore. I mean, I think she's right about that. Even if he had succeeded in making her leave at this point and he had gone back, I think at some point he would have left too because he just can't go back to how it was, you know, because he has different knowledge now. And I think that is what they're trying to say. And if you put that in the context of season five, it actually makes a lot of sense. Gareth said it to Bob at Terminus. Um, 
because Bob was trying to get him to let them go. And he was going, look, you can just let us go. We're not going to say anything. We'll just be on our way. We won't bother you again. And Gareth says, you can't go back. And that's his way of saying, no, no, you know about us. And there's no way we can let you go now. It would be too dangerous because you know about us and you're not going to go back to being innocent about what we're doing here. You know, um, same thing when Rick killed Lampson. Lampson was saying, just let me go back. I'll, you know, um, smooth it over with Dawn. I'll make sure that everything gets done. But this was after he knocked Sasha out and then ran and tried to escape. So <laughs> Rick's going, yeah, no, we don't trust you to do that. And now that you know about us, it's never going to be the same. And so he says, you can't go back, Bob. So I really have enjoyed thinking about that theme and what it means. And very specifically that it is tied to the CRM and Uh, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but they clearly knew back in season five that this is what was going to happen with Rick, that he would become trapped mentally in the CRM and that they were going to kind of brainwash him and he was going to go through so much trauma that he would stop trying to escape. Um, And they foreshadowed that big time in season five. So the other way is um, that they foreshadowed that and that I know that is the case is excuse me, when he starts talking about Carl and everything, he talks about how he stopped being able to remember what Carl looked like. And a lot of that was because, you know, the guy who does the pictures on the phone said that he could never get Carl right. And that's probably why he sort of forgot what he looked like. But the guy was able to get Michonne and Judith a little bit better. And so he had those reminders of them. So he was able to keep them in his head a little bit more. But he felt like he lost Carl all over again. And then he just talks about how um, once he also lost her face, he felt like he had died. And he figured out how to keep living in the CRM, you know, like physically living, even though he was dead inside. And he said... Um, I know how to be dead and live. And so he means like emotionally or spiritually dead, but still alive and functioning and being a soldier for the CRM. So what that means is that he really was a drone for them. You know, he really was mindless and passionless and just doing what they wanted. And obviously that's a problem. (laughs) That would be surviving, but not living, as Beth would say. But see, what that really took me back to when he said that was his speech in... Uh, 510, which is them. Remember, he talks about his grandfather and about how um, his grandfather told him that in order to survive the war, he just basically needed to survive and and to tell himself every day he was dead, now get up and go to work. You're probably going to die today. You're dead anyway. Get up and go to work. And that was how his grandfather survived the horrors of the war. And that is very similar to what happened with Rick here. He was so traumatized and had dealt with so much loss, not being able to get back to his family, that it sort of schismed his mind a little bit. And he had to protect himself mentally. It's just what human beings do. And so he was dead, even though he was still alive. (laughs) And that speech was, we are the walking dead, right? And I, I don't know, I think that's almost the overarching theme for the show, is the walkers represent um, people who just autonomous, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, they're like autom- automatons? Okay, I cannot say that word. They just sort of zombie their way through life, for, ba- for lack of a better word, and they aren't truly living, right? They um, do what other people want. They never achieve anything. They don't go after, you know, really meaningful relationships. They never learn anything. They never transcend. Nothing like that. And so that's what The Walking Dead is. People who are alive and walking around, but they don't have a soul. And that's contrasted, of course, with our main characters who life is really hard for them and they struggle a lot and they have a lot of loss, but they're fighting to keep their humanity, right? Um, Anyway, but my point in bringing that up is that number one, they Gimple clearly already knew what was going to happen with Rick when he was writing the episodes for season five. And we actually do know that now. He said in an interview um, that a lot of really heavy restraints were put on him for season six through eight, even though he was showrunner and so he could make a lot of the creative decisions. They basically wanted him to stick to the comic book material for those. They wanted to get through the comics. So that was, you know, of course, all out war. And um, I think it's not even so much that he got more uh, freedom when it got to some of the later storylines like the Commonwealth because that is still comic book stuff but at that point he was promoted to chief content officer um, so he wasn't doing the day to day stuff on the show anyway but the point is he was not free to tell his own story until he got through the comic book material 
and it just took a long time to get through the comic book material. Now we are in an era or a, a part of the show where none of this is in the comics. None of it, okay? The CRM is not in the comics. Um, Rick and Michonne are not together in the comics. Beth and Daryl are not part of the comics. Carol is, but she was long dead by this time. Okay, so um, the point is, this is all Gimple's territory at this point, and we have gotten through the comic book material. So now he can go back to the story that he set up in season five and has always wanted to tell. And, of course, the same episode where Rich, Rick made this speech about being the walking dead, which was very clearly fulfilled in this episode and learning what happened to him and why he never left the CRM. That is the same episode where the music box woke up and the music box they tell us right in the episode represents Beth. So um, that's really, really heartening. <laughs> and then of course we had that Beth doppelganger in the last episode. So it's just a matter of time, guys. Um, and we also know now that Daryl Dixon season two is going to be coming in the summer, which is not too long after this gets over. It'll, it'll be a few months. But originally, they were going to put it in the fall. We didn't think we were getting it until like August, September, maybe, you know, the October slot that Walking Dead used to be in. But now they're saying it's coming in the summer. So that gives us a lot of hope that it's going to be this year that um, a lot of people have been talking about how the final episode of The Ones Who Live are going to air on is going to air on Easter Sunday. So, of course, we're hoping for some sort of Beth sighting or Beth hint or Beth clue or something like that. But even if we don't get it, I still think that she's going to show up in season two of Daryl Dixon. So uh, either way, I'm here for it. Um, all right. So that, that was, those were probably my biggest things about the episode is how much it was like still and alone, how many callbacks there were. And then the fact that we can connect this very, very directly through what they were saying to um, Coda and then them, which is where the music box woke up. Um, let's see. She gives him a phone with Carl's image, which was sweet. And then they went down in the elevator um, and the building comes down, which which did feel like a little bit of a callback to the um, CDC blowing up in Atlanta. It just felt very similar to that. Um, they get in the car. Now, the car is interesting. It's a yellow car, first of all. I'm sure you noticed that. It's also a hybrid. So at first when they get there, it's electric and it's plugged in. So we have kind of a battery theme going on there, the electric part of it. But there's also ethanol in the back seat, which is gasoline. And ethanol has been a huge um, theme throughout the whole Walking Dead universe. We've seen it not only in uh, the flagship show. I mean, we have all the gas station references, you know, in season four. We had a lot of those. And... Uh, we also saw it in a big way in Fear the Walking Dead. Somebody put ethanol in their water and poisoned them with it. So it's just something that we've seen a lot. It's a very common symbol. Um, but again, just the fact that the car is yellow is kind of a big deal. And then we see the building collapse. And at the end, Gimple was kind of funny when he was talking about the episode insider part. He said... Um, you know, they are in a really good place when they leave and the story's in a really positive place. And yeah, at this point, they're okay and they can go home. And then he says, yeah, we probably should have just left it there and left everyone on a good note for the end of the season. But um, this is The Walking Dead. <laughs> and he just left it at that. So clearly <laughs> things are going to go wrong. <laughs> um, but we kind of figured that. In the next episode, we do see them in a cabin, which kind of reminded me of the Moonshine Shack. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Um, and then we also see them, it looks like they're trapped in a car surrounded by walkers, which is similar to Daryl and Aaron, uh, in season six, just before Morgan shows up. So, um, it'll be interesting to see the symbolism there and where they go with it in the next episode. And honestly, it'll be interesting to see what actually happens next, because it does feel very, I mean, not that I thought it was resolved because there's what, three or four more episodes still, but it feels very resolved. And of course, that's always a red heron in The Walking Dead. It'll be resolved for about 10 seconds and then something's going to go wrong again. So I am very interested to see where they're going to go with it because I really thought that more of season one would be focused on getting Rick out of the CRM and like that he wouldn't finally decide to go with her and come home until like the last episode. But we're only really halfway through the season. So you kind of wonder what else they have in store for us now that this has been decided. Um, but anyway, overall, I really liked the episode. I'm sure there's plenty that I didn't pick up on that I'll need to go back and rewatch or rely on my fellow theorists to tell me about. But it was really a fun episode. It was very sweet. And uh, yeah, I just really liked it. So let me know how you guys liked it. And I will be back uh, throughout the week to answer more of your questions. Bye.